Hello, everyone, and welcome to the series finale of Star Trek October, a Star Trek Adventures actual play. Yes, you heard correct. Tonight will be the very last session under the Deep Space October banner. But don't fret. We're simply just going to take a week off after this week, and we will return on February 9th with a new crew on a new ship. Though, because it is in the same canon as Deep Space October and Fenrir, you're going to see some returning faces. You're going to see, for example, Captain Lee coming in. You're going to see Alel coming in, and a few others from DSO who you'll see in time. But the only thing I really need to say at this point is that tonight is going to be a courtroom episode. And like any courtroom episode, tensions and emotions are going to run high. And I say this just because it's important to set expectations. We're playing characters. We're not actually trying to annoy people out of character. We're having a good angsty time is the goal of this. And I'm not going to lie. If someone finds out a way to do a few good men and do, you're goddamn right I did. I, I may award all the momentum. I'm just, I'm just going to throw that out there. Um, but with that said, let's just go around and have everyone introduce themselves, uh, starting with the captain. Hey everybody, I'm Dag. I play the Zaldin Captain Kiswick. Um, I'm so ambivalent and anxious about what's going to happen today. It's going to rock hard. So stay tuned. And if you want to talk about it afterwards, hit me up at Trek Nexus on Twitter. John here. Uh, I play Jaro Terrell. Um, somebody that uh, tends to lead with his heart a little bit more so than uh, listening to commands, it seems. So uh, looking forward to tonight's game. Hello, everyone. My name is Matthew. I play the Cation Lieutenant Jana, the Chief Engineer of October. Uh, hey, guys. I am Aaron. I play Dr. Dottig, the Chief Medical Officer and a very argumentative Tellerite. And I'm Watney. I play Lieutenant Commander Stetko, the Chief of Security of October. You can find me on Twitch at Doc Watney. And if you don't know me by now, I'm ELH, the Game Master. And unlike all of our previous episodes, we're actually not going to start with our video. Uh, we're just going to jump straight into an opening log, but it's not going to come from any of the current players. It's actually going to come uh, through the Fleet Admiral herself. So let me get the music going and we'll go ahead and get started. Fleet Admiral Ignatrix's personal log, Stardate 93104.7. I finally arrived at Deep Space October after nearly a month of travel. With me is the newly formed Babylon fleet. Comprised of 10 ships, the fleet will be based out of DSO as Starfleet pushes further out into the depths of the Alpha Quadrant. As this is going to drastically change the day-to-day -day of the station, I thought it only prudent to move my official office as well. And as she trails off on that sentence, we sort of cut to a scene outside of Deep Space October where warping in is the USS Titor, a premonition class. And it's followed by three Quasar ships, two Dauntless and two Sutherland classes. And then the log resumes. That leads me to my current problem. Captain Kiswick has, in all fairness, done a fair job as station commander. Yet, after the mission in which an Iconian facility was lost to the Breen, all I've received are reports that his senior staff is, for lack of a better term, on the verge of breaking up. Regulations already dictated that a hearing must have been held for such an event. I only worry that getting them to state their reasoning will further drive a wedge in the family that is, was, DSO's senior staff. Only time will tell, I suppose. And log. And with that, we're now going to cut to your ready room, Captain Kijwick. As you are preparing some last minute items and speaking with whoever you wish before the fleet admiral arrives. So you do have a moment to uh, calm yourself if you so wish, but otherwise just give me a signal when you want the fleet admiral to come in. All right, Cargo Bay. Make sure everything is in order, just in case the Admiral orders a surprise inspection. I want to make sure all the final supply rosters are transmitted to myself and Commander Hatea. She's going to be going over the logs line by line, 
just to make sure the Admiral doesn't find any discrepancies. Hopefully it doesn't come to come down to that, but make it happen. Keswick out. Hmm. Go ahead. All right. And right on cue, there's a chime at your door and uh, assuming you let them enter. Uh, in steps the fleet admiral herself. Now, for those who don't know Ignatrix by now, which, I mean, if you're watching me, I would think you do, but for those who don't, uh, Ignatrix is a Zanette, which means she has stark blue skin, uh, glowing, almost piercing yellow eyes, prismatic hair that's mostly blue and red, and though she can manifest wings, she doesn't have them on today. Instead, she's rocking uh, science blue colors with the fleet admiral Pips. And as she walks in, uh, she, of course, looks at you, Kiswick, nods curtly, but doesn't go for the chair itself. Instead, she walks right over to the replicator and Kiswick says... Kiswick would be standing oh, at attention, by the way. Ah, and I think I think the fleet admiral notices this, doesn't say anything, but goes to the replicator and says, T, Earl Grey, hot. And the computer sort of chimes in and says, please specify hot. And Indatrix just sort of rolls her eyes and says, just give it to me how Picard gets it. And T materializes. She takes the mug, takes a sip, smacks her lips a little bit and turns and says, oh, Captain, you, you can sit down. You don't need to stand on ceremony for me. Acknowledged. And I'll, Kishwick will sit. Welcome and to DSO. Thank you. Thank you. And she's going to wander over to the main window that lets you look out on the command deck. And keeping her back to you, she's just going to sort of look out and go, well, I must say, you've done a rather good job of keeping the station together, Captain, but I wouldn't be here if I didn't have at least some bad news. Uh, should I lay it out for you, or do you want to take a guess? You've always been pretty direct with me in the past. I wouldn't have it any other way. Well, to be blunt, uh, we have to have a hearing. Anytime a uh, ship or a mission or a ship gets damaged or a mission like that happens, uh, some kind of hearing has to be held. Uh, however, I'm greatly concerned for the state of your family, for the lack of a better term. I've not heard good things since our last encounter. You're not wrong. Running the station has been fairly routine for the last month, but relations among my senior staff continue to be tense and even deleterious to some degree. Hmm. Um, my chief of engineering and I have not spoken since uh, our return to the station. My helmsman is all but a recluse. My doctor and I discuss things at a formality level only. It seems that uh, only my chief of security has escaped this level of tension. Hmm. Doesn't surprise me. She's Betazoid. They tend to get over that sort of thing very quickly. And at this point, she actually turns around and regards you fully. So, Captain, I'm going to be blunt with you. You have a choice here. You can either prosecute your officers yourself, or I'm going to requisition one of your senior staff to do the job. As I am the senior commander on the station, I will accept this duty. I will prosecute the hearing. I would like to make a recommendation, however. Go on. I would like my doctor, my CMO, to be the chief defense. And she sort of sets the tea down on that little ledge uh, that's afforded by the window, strokes her chin with those uh, avian-like golden claws, and goes, hmm. Now I have a better idea. Captain, you're going to be on defense, and your doctor's going to be on the prosecution. Are you trying to get us to see each other's perspectives by living them? In a sense. I also just think it's more prudent for the commanding officer to not be badgering his own officers when everybody's competency is on the line here. A wise move. Mm. The doctor is well-versed at badgering people in the first place. Well, 
honestly, I have to go prepare your um, hearing room. I'm told that it hasn't been used since, well, since the station was built, so I have to go make sure it's up to specs. Um, I leave it to you to inform Mr. Dottig, but be very clear with him that if he does not perform his duty as a pseudo-JAG officer to the fullest extent of his capabilities, just tell him I'm going to have some very choice words for him. Understood. As always, the services of DSO are at your disposal. I appreciate that, Captain. And she starts making for the door, but then stops midway and goes, Oh, um, you've probably already known this, Captain, but I will be planting my flag here for the foreseeable future. I don't want to say I'm just taking your office, but you probably want to pick a different one. You're not going to lose command, but I just have to have the biggest office, you know, appearances and all that. A look of consternation will flash across Kiswick's face very quickly, mm -hmm. fading back to formality. Of course, Admiral. Very good. I'll see you around. And, and Kiswick uh, will stand as she exits. And she leaves. And... The door closes behind her, and it's one of those things where you maybe look past her and maybe breathe in and out a little bit to calm yourself. And then you notice she left her tea mug on the ledge of the window, almost purposefully. It's her office now. Um, since it's pretty Spartan, Kiswick will grab... The, uh, the only relic of his that he considers um, sentimental, the mm -hmm. map of Zald, and uh, dis disconnect the hologram and place the generator uh, in a little utility pouch. And he'll look around at the room and, uh, you know, changes in the air. And he will wait a beat so uh, the Admiral can have left the bridge mm -hmm. um, before he exits the bridge or exits the ready room as well. All righty. For the last time. As so. commander in that ready room. <laughs> yep. All right. So uh, okay. where we're going to meet next is actually going to be in sick bay, uh, maybe a few hours after this. And uh, Kijwick, I think you've come to tell uh, Dottig of his duty. So I'm going to let you and Dottig figure that out in character rather than uh, force a scenario on you. Um, Kijwick would enter. Is that Nurse Chan? Yep, Nurse Chan. And she, and... she kind of looks up and goes, ah, Captain, hello, how are you doing? Are you feeling all right? I'm fine. I'm I'm here to see the good doctor. And Chan just sort of looks past uh, towards the office and goes, Hey, Doc, you got the cats in here to see you. Send him in. And Chan just sort of motions with her hand that you can go on, Captain. Doctor? Captain? What can I do for you? Admiral Ignatrix is here, and as duty requires, there's going to be an inquiry into our actions aboard the Umbriel on our last away mission. Understood. As the highest ranking officer underneath the Admiral on the station, I am JAG. I have been drafted into the JAG service, and I will be on the defense during this inquiry. I have asked that you prosecute. You want me to prosecute the senior staff in a general competency hearing? Yes. You want me to try to prove that my colleagues are terrible at their jobs? If terrible is the adjective you choose, I might pick another, but 
to say the least. I believe you are well fit for the role of seeing this angle. It is also an opportunity for me to review the events from as best I can your perspective. Well, regardless with... of the divide between us, you are the highest rank officer on Deep Space October that I can still fully trust to be forward and direct with the other officers. Somewhere off screen, we see Hatea go, sh- you know, start to share. And like, why is, is nobody talking about me? Well, most would say that you bring rather grim news, that I have a rather grim duty. However, I do enjoy the adversarial process. I assume that this is an order from the Admiral. It could be. It could be if I express express reluctance. Yeah. She also said you better abide by every rule and regulation or she's going to come down on you and me. I understand. I'll discharge that responsibility to the best of my ability. I don't think I could expect any less. But Captain, know this, that I will not, as the humans say, pull any punches with any of you. That's why I chose you. If there is fault to be found, and blame to be placed, I will find it. I think that's why you're the top man for the job. Well, I guess I'd best get started, but before I do, because I don't think it's prudent for us to speak again until after the hearing, let me just say this. I think you did the wrong thing. But I think you did the wrong thing for the right reason. I can appreciate that. And I will state that in the hearing. For what it's worth, I think you let your scientific curiosity override your good judgment. But I think if I had been in your place, I too may have prioritized that new technology. Well, maybe it is best that I'm under prosecution because, Captain, I don't think you understand my thinking at all. As you were. Understood, sir. Kijwick will exit. All right. So we're actually going to now cut to the hearing room. And out of character, I need to say a few things before we actually do that. Um, So the way the hearing is going to be set up is there are going to be three admirals on duty. There's going to be Admiral Hamasi, uh, who you may remember from session one. Uh, Obviously, Fleet Admiral Ignatrix is going to be there as well. And then Rear Admiral Archuleta will be there as the third admiral. And there will be, of course, the three admirals on duty. You'll have Master Chief Arnold presiding as court stenographer. Uh, Datig, of course, is prosecution. Kiswick, your defense. Uh, The gallery will be limited in that only high-ranking diplomatic individuals and any 
shall we say, senior staff or senior staff adjacent characters can be there. Um, but what I need to know is what characters would be there from the beginning and which ones would come in only when they're called. Like, when are your characters going to be there is what I'm after. Um, so I don't have to ask Dottig and Kizrit because they're going to be there the entire time. Let's start with Jaro. Jaro, Ooh. when are you coming in? Only for his piece. Only for your piece. All right, so you're not coming in until the very end, just so you know. Mm -hmm. um, Jana, when are you coming in? I think it would be the same for Jana as well. Okay, Jana's going to come in at the end too. All right, Stetko, when are you coming in? The end? No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what? What? Like, what's the situation again? How are we like for coming in? Uh, you'll be called in one by one, answer some questions, uh, basically have your competency questioned by Dottig. Okay. Um, but it's one of those things where um, whether or not you are there for the other people who are going to be called to the hearing is entirely up to your volition. Um, yeah, so Stetko would probably be there the whole time. Be there the whole time. She would be right. there early. Be there early even. Yeah. Noted. Do we want to fix cameras? Uh, did That's cameras get mixed up? Yeah. Yep. All right, I'll let you guys fix that as okay. I move us over and describe the scene. So uh, we now cut to the courtroom of Deep Space October. Now, it does look a little bit TOS and partially because that's only the courtroom that we have available to us, <laughs> um, but also because I flavor it as Ignatrix just likes the sort of old style of things. Um, so in classic TOS fashion, um, you have the panel of admirals uh, sort of sitting up a little bit higher than everybody else. And they have uh, some, some computer terminals at their desks. Uh, before the fleet admiral herself, there is a little golden bell with a little hammer. Um, to their immediate, immediate right on the ground floor uh, is where the stenographer, Arnold, is basically typing away on the pad, making sure that the record is kept both in textual and recorded format. Uh, Kijwick and Dottig, you both have a desk uh, on opposite sides of the room. And then in the middle of the room is a chair on a raised platform where the person that is giving their statement is to be seated. And then at the very rear of the room is where characters such as Stetko, Boothby, and any other, again, high-ranking individual that filters in will be seated. But uh, as everybody filters into the courtroom... Uh, there's, I think it's safe to say, a feeling of unease in the air, a feeling of dread. And I say that mostly for Stetko's sake, because again, empath. Um, but as everybody sits down... Oh, it's bad. Yeah, it's bad. <laughs> as, uh, as everybody takes their seats, gets situated, uh, the fleet admiral sighs, picks up the golden hammer, and tings the bell twice. So, ting, ting... We will now begin the competency hearing for the senior staff of Deep Space October, as Dr. Dottig will be representing the prosecution for all other officers. We will be handling Mr. Dottig first. If you'd be so kind, Doctor, I'd like you to take the stand. Yep. Dottig will take the stand. And of course, after you go through the swearing in process and you sit down, um, the fleet admiral kind of looks at you, studying you very carefully. And she starts off by saying, let's start off with an easy one. Please state your name and rank and your official duties on the station. Keith Dottig, Commander, Chief Medical Officer, Deep Space October, USS Umbriel. Very good. I'd like you to recount the events as you saw them leading up to Stardate 93022.5. Very good. There was a raffle on the station at uh, one of the bars. The opportunity of a lifetime was the tagline. Uh, this raffle was won by uh, Captain Cord, a Klingon freighter captain that operates out of this sector fairly regularly. As the coordinates for the prize of this raffle were located close to brain space and well out of range of his ship. Uh, 
he was taken by Commander Stetko and Captain Kijwick, myself, the rest of the senior staff aboard the USS Umbriel, uh, to collect his prize winnings. Hmm. It was when we arrived, we found a small container, approximately three cubic meters, contained within a Uh, infant changeling. Scans revealed its morphogenic matrix was identical to the female changeling that orchestrated the Dominion War. And at this, Admiral Hamasi leans in, and as a reminder, Admiral Hamasi is a uh, dark-furred Cation, dark hair, uh, has a rose ornamentation in her hair, but uh, she sort of leans in and goes, now let's be very clear on this, Doctor, you're saying that, if I understand what you are saying, you're saying that this is the female changeling displaced through time, correct? Correct. Very good. Uh, Did you ever figure out why that was the case? Uh, unfortunately not. Um, though we will get to that later, I believe that the Iconian facility we abandoned was the key to that. And of course, proceed, Doctor. Um, we brought the changeling aboard. Um, there were concerns that Captain Cord would want to take the changeling back to Kronos, where it would undoubtedly be put to a painful death uh, per Klingon prejudice. Uh, the captain elected not to reveal, uh, at least in the beginning, uh, what the container held. Uh, we did some scans. I placed it in a quarantine field. Uh, it got out. And although we were ordered to preserve the timeline, I interacted with it. And at this, Fleet Admiral Ignatrix speaks up and says, so you willingly broke the Temporal Prime Directive in this instance. My interaction was merely to place it in a new container. Now, that's a funny thing, Doctor, because I have a report here that states that you were trying to, for lack of a better term, get it to change into a certain shape, get it to act like a child. Is this an incorrect report that I've received? I spoke to it as I was transferring it to a new container. Well, the Temporal Prime Directive does certainly apply. That does not excuse us treating a living, breathing, sentient thing like an inert sample. Continue, Doctor. The changeling was placed in in a new container, placed back into stasis. We traced the pod back to the Iconian facility, uh, which at the time was malfunctioning. The decision was then made as we were close to Breen space and Breen ships were on an intercept course that Lieutenant Sturrell, Jana, and myself would take the changeling Aboard the Banshee and attempt to find either an answer or a way to send the changeling back to its own time or both aboard the Iconian facility. After some difficulty, we did make landfall and access the control center, for lack of a better term. Uh, it was at this moment that the Breen attacked the Umbriel, outside of the asteroid field. You have been briefed on the nature of the Iconian facility, I presume, with the singularities, with the planet... With the black the holes, yes. We we all have received and read the reports, yes. Well, uh, after noticing that the particle streams were asymmetrical, uh, Lieutenant Terrell, Jana, and myself corrected the issue, stabilized the planet, uh, and began to look for a way to use the facility to 
send the changeling back. At first, we thought the facility was the con, but after uh, some very expert and uh, quite insightful analysis by my junior officers, we discovered that the facility was indeed Iconian. Hmm. And thus, continue that investigation. I believe at that time the Umbreo was having a great deal of difficulty with the brain ships. Not that I blame them being so greatly outnumbered. In the course of our investigation, Mr. Terrell beamed back aboard the Banshee to assist the Umbreo in combating the brain. Well, Lieutenant Jana and I stayed aboard to attempt to continue our own mission. Uh, but also to help the Umbreo in our own way. We released Iconian probes that would have eventually disabled most, if not all, of the brain chips. By this time, the Umbreo itself was inside uh, the asteroid field, and still under attack, Captain Kijwick uh, gave the order to evacuate. Lieutenant Jana and I protested in the strongest possible way. But in the end, it was Lieutenant Terrell who beamed us aboard the Banshee and took us back to the Umbreon. At which point, we left. I suppose also I'm forgetting the, <laughs> the Federation starship that was interrupting the matter stream in one of the singularities. And Inatrix picks up a pad and looks at it and goes, yes, uh, the USS Bastet, correct? Right, the USS Bastet and uh, some Lieutenant Chernobyl or something or other. Hmm. I'm looking into this personally, but as far as any Starfleet records show, there has never been a USS Bastet. However, your sensor logs are very conclusive that this ship did exist. Matter for another time, I suppose. But before I ask my questions, Hamasi, Archuleta, do you have any of your own? None at this time. And Hamasi says the same, and Ignatrix says, Very well, then I will proceed on with my own. First things first, Doctor, I want to be very clear on this. When you were given the order to go on this away team mission past the border of Breen Space, was there any objections to the violation of sovereign territory? No. So you willingly admit that you and the rest of the officers aboard the Umbriel willingly violated the sovereignty of the Breen? Yes. Very good. On a more personal note, I see that in many of the records aboard Deep Space October that you have a record of repeated conflicts with Stetko, the chief of security. Do you wish to clarify the nature of these conflicts for the record uh, professional differences can you be more specific I object to security oversight on medical matters I see I see why did you bring a triple aboard the station medical research <laughs> mm. and am I to understand that that triple was properly disposed of <laughs> yes off screen, after, uh, after off screen, we kind of go up through the the ceiling of the uh, the courtroom, and just in a vent somewhere, there's a triple just moving <laughs> along. But uh, we come back down to the courtroom, and Ignatrix just sort of sighs and goes, "Okay." Another question about this: uh, Why has Lieutenant Terrell still not undergone a full physical? You've had him on station for almost two years now, and I still don't see a full physical here. Well. Have you ever tried to run down a young Terran? Several times, in fact, yes. I dated one uh, when I was in the Academy. Well, have you ever done it with a prosthetic leg? Can't say I have, no. Well, and as you can see, my gait is, uh, well, would be awkward enough without uh, a prosthetic left leg. Uh, with that left leg, I am... We'll just put it this way. I'm wasted on cross-country. We Tellarites are natural sprinters, very dangerous over short distances. 
I'm going to look past that remark. I only have one further question for you, doctor, before you may begin your depositions. Do you believe, as your professional opinion as chief medical officer, do you believe that any of the senior staff are not of sound mind and or body? Officially, no. Unofficially? Well, with the the results of the last mission and the clear mandate of Starfleet regulation, I have been given cause to occasionally think about the captain's mental state. Hmm. Well, we'll be delving into the captain's mental state when he is deposed. Uh, Admirals, any other questions before we release Mr. Dottig here? No, thank you for your time, Doctor. Doctor, you may step down from the stand. He'll take his place back at his prosecutor's desk. It is at this point that the Admiral tings the bell once and says, Very well, the next person to be deposed will be Lieutenant Commander Stetko. I see you're already in the room. Miss Stetko, if you would please take the stand. And of course you step up, you get yourself sworn in, take a seat, and now it's Dottig's turn to run the show, which is going to be the amazing part, I think. So go ahead, Mr. Dottig. Commander Stetko. <laughs> Doctor? Please, uh, for the record, state your rank and position aboard the station. I'm Lieutenant Commander Arzu Stetko. I serve Deep Space Starbase October as the Chief Security Officer, Armory Quartermaster, and Tactical Liaison to the Sector. Very impressive list of titles. <sighs> Commander. How would you rate your own performance in your duty? I would give myself a seven to eight out of 10. Very good. So it's safe to say that you do take your duty aboard the station and the Umbriel very seriously. Yes, I do. How would you rate your ability to act on your own volition without the oversight of the captain? Well, I wouldn't act on my own volition outside of the authority of the captain. Maybe I should rephrase. In... In instances where the captain's direct supervision is not required or available, do you feel able to discharge your duty? Yes. I have 10 department heads who report directly to me. I would be not well suited for my position if I couldn't delegate and get things done. Absolutely. I agree. When you came aboard at the station, you took great pains to make a personal impact upon station security. Uh, this has been noted by many officers. You are very hands-on with security duties and by all reports would not ask anyone to do something that you would not do yourself. Is that an accurate assessment? Yes, I am a, uh, well, I strive to be a leader, not a boss. Very good. I recall an incident early in our time together aboard a DSO where you went so far as to chase a perpetrator to Jeffrey's tubes onto the promenade to make an arrest. Do you remember that? Yes, I do. So, would you say that you pursued the rest of your duties with that zeal? I would say in my time aboard the station, I've become a little more lax on petty theft, but 
overall, yes, I think I'd maintain a similar consistency. It's interesting that you state that you have, over time, become more lax on petty theft. Because it would appear that the preoccupation with petty theft allowed the conspiracy to smuggle biomimetic gel aboard the station with intention to create biogenic weapons. This flew under the radar for, well, we are still not quite sure how long. Furthermore, a changeling infiltrator escaped the station with a quantity of biomimetic gel that would be quite dangerous in the wrong hands. How do you account for this? Well, I would say that, you know, petty theft without a pattern isn't worrisome, but there was definitely a pattern and that's what I was chasing. As to the changeling escaping, I had him in my sights, but um, in order to ensure the station we're sitting in now was not in pieces, we had to let him go. When you say we had to let him go, who gave the order? It was uh, Captain Kijwick. Captain Kijwick gave the order to release a terrorist with a dangerous substance capable of devastating entire worlds. You Objection, Your Honor. And Ignatrix looks over at you. Yes, Captain. Regulation 3, paragraph 12, clearly states, in the event of imminent destruction, a Starfleet captain is authorized to preserve the lives of his or her crew or their crew by any justifiable means. And the fleet admiral looks at Hamasi. Hamasi nods, looks over at Archuleta. Nods as well. Sustained. Uh, doctor, be a little bit less brash. Very good. Let, let me rephrase the question. Do you think that was the right decision? I am not sure. A candid answer that I appreciate. Well, perhaps I should ask it another way. As a member of Starfleet, you are ready to lay down your life in the line of duty, is that correct? Yes, I am. Would you say that by allowing this gel, and we'll get to the rest of it in just a moment, but I think this is a, a very good point. Do you think that by allowing this gel off the station, potentially putting civilians at risk, do you think that is a justifiable means? Yes. We made the same call near brain territory. And when you say we made the same call, who made that decision? Captain Kishwick did. And let's talk about brain space for just a moment. The regulation that Captain Kishwick so expertly pointed out. Regulation 3, paragraph 12. The event of imminent destruction of Starfleet captain was authorized to preserve the lives of his crew by any justifiable means. Plainly written, but not so plainly interpreted sometimes. Wouldn't you agree? So Seka will kind of look to the admirals like, is this a serious question? <laughs> and yeah, they, they sort of motion that, yeah, you need to answer it. Ishwick is going to object here. Objection. Council, yes, is comparing, council is comparing apples to oranges. I'm sorry, did you just use a, hidi a human idiom in my courtroom? <laughs> uh, apologies, Admiral. <laughs> so Archuleta is going to be a little like, 
hello. <laughs> I get it. No, and I, I, I think that it, the whole point was to make Watney laugh because it would play across Archuleta. And the whole point of that is Ignatrix actually cracks a smile and says, look, I know we're all doom and gloom, but if I can't make a joke, you know, the whole point of this is moot. I understand where you're going, Captain, but I'm, I'm going to need a bit more of a stringent objection here than just apples and oranges. Council is attempting to compare Commander Stetko's decisions in a hypothetical situation with a real situation in which the commander was not in command. Mm. The decision was not hers to make. The degree to which the commander may respond is not truly reflective of the situation Council is asking about. Inatrix looks to Mossy. Mossy nods. Looks at Archuleta. She looks like she'll barely let it pass, but yeah, sure. Very well sustained. Right. You'll have to rephrase, Council. <clears throat> Very good. Commander Setko, are you aware of Starfleet General Order 5? Refresh my memory. Uh, said General Order prohibits Starfleet officers from transporting out of a dangerous situation if it would put others at risk by doing so. Yes, I recall it. Lieutenant Jana and I were at the Iconian facility. Our refusal to transport out was predicated upon this regulation. Having Umbreo enter the system to such an extent would place it in unnecessary risk. You said yourself that Starfleet officers are required at times to lay down their lives in defense of others. As chief of security, do you believe Captain Kijwick violated General Order 5. I do. Thank you. As we've heard in previous testimony, Captain Court won a raffle. And that's where all this started. Please elaborate on your relationship with Captain Cord. <laughs> and Hamasi <clears throat> speaks up and says, Stetko, keep it together. Um, apologies. Uh, Captain Cord and I are friends. Very good. Very good. Friends. We've also discussed the, the Banshee previously. In searching manifest records, I can find no entry for the cloaking device that's employed in the Banshee. Where did you acquire it? Um, what was the race again, GM? Uh, you mean I'm the totally uh, blanking. I, the the race that you? Yeah, I'm blanking on the name as well, but I know the one the you mean. Giant yeah. The giant dreadnought. We acquired it from an enemy dread dreadnought uh, ship. Oh, you what mean the, the Sona? You mean the Sona, the Sona ship? Sona. I thought you yeah. meant like the race itself that you guys. Yeah, did. yeah, yeah, yeah. The the Sona. Uh, hmm. We acquired it uh, after um, spending extended time researching the Sona dreadnought from. A while back and uh we had some technology from that investigation very good you're an empath correct that's correct lieutenant jaro disobeyed the direct order from captain kishwick to return to the umbrio were you in a position to sense his emotional state? And if so, why did you do nothing to prevent it? What Jam, would I have been able to? I would say it would have been on the edge of your perception in the certain circumstance, because I went back and watched the VOD at least three times to make sure that I didn't miss anything. 
you never asked the question, so it never came up, but it would have been at the edge of your senses, yes. Okay. Um, and John, what would he have been, like, what would his emotional state have been? Um, <laughs> Jaro's emotional state at that time would have been, um, for lack of a better word, um, controlled panic. I'm sorry, I do have a cat here. <laughs> You're fine. You're fine. Um, doctor, I don't answer those kinds of questions. I will remind you that you are under oath. I'm not obligated to give information like that to you. I think we'll sort of look back at the tribunal. And I think Hamasi speaks up and says, it is her right as a Starfleet officer and Federation citizen. She does not have to answer any questions that would self-incriminate or otherwise feel, um, you, you know where I'm going with this. If she doesn't want to answer, she doesn't have to. Very well. I would like to add an addendum to that, that my desire not to answer that question is not out of a desire to not self-incriminate, but rather that I don't divulge information like that about others unless I deem it's necessary, and I don't think it's necessary. You don't believe it's necessary to account for your actions or lack of? I don't believe it's necessary for me to disclose another officer's emotional state in a time of crisis. We all Very go good. through the academy. That we do. Some more easily than others. Well, thank you, Commander. This has been most illuminating. And he'll turn to the captain and say, your witness. Ishwick will stand behind the table, nod at each of the admirals present, Master Chief, Prosecution, step to the front of the table. The stern look crosses his face. Prosecution has no questions for this witness at this time. Defense, you mean? Correct. <laughs> Defense has no questions at this time. Are you sure, sir? I am. Ignatrix looks to Hamasi. Hamasi shakes her head and looks to Archuleta. Does Archuleta sure. have any questions? Her um, eyebrow is very severely quirked up, like, really? Um, but she lets it slide. No, no questions. And Trix nods and says, very well. Stetko, you may leave the stand. Thank you. Now, to be very clear here, Stetko, do you remain in the courtroom or yes. do you book? Okay. So you remain in the courtroom. You go back to your seat. And as uh, you sit down, uh, Boothby, or quote-unquote Boothby, the 84721, sort of leans in and says, maybe a little bit too loudly, you, uh, you all right after that? If I uh, had heard that back at the academy, uh, let's just say the old whippersnapper that I pissed off uh, wouldn't have taken it very well. That's to you, Stutko, by the way. Oh, I'm sorry. What did you say again? I'm so sorry. I was no, just you're responding fine. to your DM. <laughs> oh, I see. No, basically, Boothby's like, hey, are you all right? You you oh. made, you didn't lose your temper, you know, kind of a thing. Uh, she turns them and she gets a, uh, she's like, her cheeks are really flushed. Like, wow, I'm glad that that's over. And she kind of turns to him, like visibly relieved that that's done. And she's like, ah, no, I am a cool cucumber. Hmm. I'll remember that. At this point, uh, Ignatrix chimes the bell again and says, Very well. Next person that we'd like to have on the stand is Mr. Kijwick himself. Of course, Kijwick, if you would like to elect counsel to represent you during your deposition, you have the right. Would you like to call upon anyone to represent you at this time? I decline counsel. Are you sure? I am sure. Then take the stand. So you step up, you get sworn in 
take a seat at the center chair. And everybody looks to Dottig at this point. Uh, anybody paying close enough attention will see that he stands maybe a little more slowly uh, this time and circles to the front of the deposition chair. Yeah. Mr. Kijwick. Well, that's not Dottig's voice, this is Dottig's voice. Mr. Kijwick. Please state your rank, name, and official duties aboard the station. Ibjin Kijwick, Captain, Deep Space October, USS Umbriel. Thank you. And per previous testimony, is there anything you would like to add to the account of the mission to the Iconian facility in Breen Space? Before I proceed to your questions. Yes. The account that was well given by my esteemed colleague on the prosecution carries with it the perspective of the away mission and does not accurately capture the events on the bridge leading up to the encounter with the Breen ships uh, through the conclusion in which the Banshee beamed up the away team and rendezvoused with the Umbriel as we left Breen Space. I would like to detail those events now. Proceed. After we recovered, the founder leader, Changeling, brought it on board. We did detect a Breen fleet proceeding on an intercept course towards Umbriel. At the same time, I was notified that a signature that was believed at the time to be Takan had been detected and that the origin of the founder leader was from that location. As I did not want the Breen anywhere near that location, the Banshee was designated to take an away team consisting of Dr. Dodig, Lieutenant Jana, and Lieutenant Jara Terrell, and the founder leader to investigate the area, return the founder leader if possible, and report back to the ship. After the Banshee left, I ordered the Umbriel to direct away from the, the mission launch to intercept the Breen fleet. The Breen fleet came in weapons hot. My attempts to hail were not returned. It was at that point I took the mission as a combat. We raised the shields and we fired on the Breen in a way that would disable their ships, not destroy them. However, there were three of them and one of us. Seeing as how this fight was not gonna be won merely with weapons fire, I had Umbriel move into an asteroid field to check in with the away mission. I was told they needed more time. So I continued to engage the brain. Shortly after that, the Banshee appeared on sensors supporting the combat mission. I am uncertain if Lieutenant Terrell took it upon himself to conduct this action uh, whether or not he was ordered or notified the mission leader on the away team. However, in a combat exercise, you take every advantage you can get. And the Banshee provided a sufficient distraction for us to continue to disable two of the Breen ships. In that window, I had two options. It was either leave two high-level Starfleet targets on a newly discovered Iconian base and hope the Breen didn't take the base and my officers into custody. 
or try and retrieve my officers. I took the first of those options. I ordered the Banshee to rendezvous with me outside of Breen space, hoping that the Breen would follow us away from the base and let the away mission proceed. The priority through all of this was to return the founder leader to its own time to keep the timeline intact. At that time, the Banshee, according to our sensor readings, deviated from the rendezvous plan and returned to the base. Once again, in a combat situation, decisions have to change. We have to be flexible. If the Banshee was heading back, presumably to retrieve or rejoin the away team, the opportunity arose to rescue my two officers. The base being in Breen space, I made the, a judgment call. We weren't going to be able to retrieve it. So I ordered the away team to allow Lieutenant Terrell to beam up, to beam them up. Regardless if that was the right call for the away team, that's what we're here to find out. It was only after they returned that I discovered that the founder leader was not in their possession, but had been picked up by an officer from the aforementioned USS Bastet. Seeing as how we're having this conversation right now, I believe we can safely assume that the timeline is intact. A safe assumption, I believe. <clears throat> the order that I gave, citing General Order 5, circumventing General Order 5, was to lessen the charges against Lieutenant Terrell for violating my order in the first place by ordering him to beam them up. I made the call. I do not deny that I violated this order, but I wasn't about to lose my helm officer, my CMO and my chief engineer to the Breen for a base whose functionality we did not know at the time. I am resolute in my decision. That is all. Very good. Your statement has been noted. But I think to understand why you made the decision you made. We have to go back. We have to go back to your time in, in the Dominion War itself. You lived through that horrible conflict. You saw firsthand the horror of war and came through that, no doubt, much different than the young man who went in. How long did you hold a captaincy during the, the Dominion War? The record shows that I was not promoted to captain until shortly before my time on Deep Space October. I was placed in command of three different vessels during the Dominion War. The USS Athene, the USS Star, and the USS Athene A. Very good. And I apologize if my colloquialism was not clear. I was, of course, referring to the privilege of any officer in command of a ship to be addressed as captain. <clears throat> so, what happened to the USS Athene? The USS Athene, in short, was destroyed by a Jem'Hadar patrol in the Gamma Quadrant side of the wormhole. Stardate 
five three eight nine two thereabouts. Very good. And I'm sorry, the name of your second ship? The Star. Um, can you the tell star. us what happened to the Star? The Star was a temporary ship assigned to the remaining Athene crew in preparation for a formal ship to be assigned. It had Excellent. been pulled out of mothballs for the war effort and was retired upon the commission of the Athene A. Um, and I wonder if you're aware that the star is now an exhibit at the Starfleet Space Flight Museum on Luna. It's a matter of pride. I appreciate every ship that I've had the privilege to serve on for Starfleet. Excellent. Uh, and the Athene A. Brief synopsis, if you would. The Athene A was a sovereign class vessel that was commissioned shortly after the destruction of the USS Athene, approximately three months. The crew of the Athene transferred 92% to the Athene A, with the other 8% uh, receiving different assignments from Starfleet. The Athene A was critical in managing the Gamma Quadrant after the Dominion War was settled finding other ships, other Starfleet and allied vessels who had gone into hiding during the war. And in 2380, pardon me, 2381, when Starfleet intelligence became aware of the Romulan supernova event, I willingly took leave from Starfleet to assist in the recovery. The Athene A was in service until 2392, if memory serves. Very good. I would imagine that your feelings on the, the Dominion War were quite potent and probably still are to this day. I do have very strong feelings towards the events of the war. But after 40 years... Tell me, Captain, did you ever face Debreen? During the Dominion War, the only time that we faced the Breen was as a part of the Jem'Hadar patrol that destroyed the USS Athene. That must leave a mark on a person. It does. At the time, Starfleet had not developed a countermeasure towards the Bream particle weapon that was able to circumvent Starfleet shields. Hmm. When they attacked, we expected that our fleet would be able to hold up until we got to the wormhole. I was the last of three crew members to escape the Athene before it was destroyed. And I would imagine that somebody who lived through the, the Dominion War, the Hobus Supernova, and the resultant devastation would well, to put it mildly, you sacrificed a lot. I'm sure that you had your fill of it. Would that be an accurate assessment? Is, is if you're that referring, why you left if, Starfleet? If you're referring to my fill of sacrifice, that is not... That never factored into my decisions to leave or rejoin Starfleet. 
and what what did factor in? The Hobus Supernova devastated Zalt. It was an obligation to my planet's government that I facilitate the ecological recovery of my homeworld. It is not a popular opinion among my peers that during that time, as ambassador of Zald to Kronos, that I negotiated neutrality with the Klingon Empire to keep Zald out of the resulting Federation war from 2400 to 2405. So Bree will step in here. Mm -hmm. uh, the whimsical nature of your loyalty to Starfleet's values, protocols, and very mission is in question, Ibsen. The threat of the Breen will, or likely has, already doubled in this sector, thanks to the abandonment of the Iconian facility. The lack of foresight and reliance on emotional decision-making you displayed mirrors you and your wife's choice to leave the Federation during the Klingon War and to maintain Zald's neutrality, despite the numerous advantages Zald's position would have given us. While we can wax poetic and toss regulations back and forth, this tribunal makes the nature of your commanding philosophy quite clear. That is all. Captain, I mean no disrespect when I say this, but I posit that the reason that you came back for the away team. The reason that you protect Lieutenant Terrell is because you are either unwilling or unable to sacrifice members of your own crew for the greater good. How do you answer that? I was unwilling to allow members of my crew with intimate knowledge of this sector and our station's functions to become prisoners of the Breen, which would pose a far greater threat to the station and the ship under whose command, under my command. Hamasi actually leans in and says, just to be clear, Captain Kijwick, are you aware that the Banshee was equipped with a cloaking device? I was then would it not have been possible had Terrell simply gone back, engaged Cloak, and waited for the Breen to leave, they could have made it back to Federation space under Cloak? It is possible. Then I must ask you, Captain, why was this option ever explored? In a combat situation? Yes, yes, we must be flexible. You've said that twice now. And I think Ignatrix actually speaks up in your defense at this point and says, Admirals, I, I think we might want to pull it back just a little bit here. What the captain's done is not in question here. I think that is not in any way something that can be denied at this point. Uh, let's proceed to a different line of questioning, Mr. Dantig. I, I think we've made your point. Very good. <clears throat> Captain Kijwick, have you been visited by any other individuals or entities claiming to be from the future? Kijwick will scowl and say, I don't understand the relevance of this line of questioning, Council. Well, prior to our incursion into brain space, were you not informed by a future version of yourself that we had to take that action. Yes. It is noted in my log, log that another individual with the time sequence matching a future version of myself declared that the events that we were about to embark on were part of a temporal cold war that had launched a new front in this time. Very good. Um, 
and the temporal cold war is i did not get sufficient detail about this conflict save to say that it is a war that traverses all temporal and geophysical boundaries I presume that the future self who informed me of this was acting on the temporal accords by providing me only the information necessary to achieve the objective. Given that we're here now, I'm not certain if we fulfilled the objective precisely, but we are still here. That much is not in dispute. Approximately how many times have you had to or reprimand Lieutenant Terrell? Counting the most recent? Three. <clears throat> I am, of course, referring to instances as well that you did not officially log there were several times where I demonstrated slack to Lieutenant Terrell for minor violations minor violations but violations all the same why is that has any other officer warranted such treatment has any other officer infracted as much several officers have been the beneficiary of me tolerating minor issues as a captain and mentor I see all the officers under, com under my command as opportunities to learn and grow. And if an officer is having a few minor violations, reprimanding them for every single one does not serve the purpose of growth and learning. Over time, an officer can grow into that role. Very good. And are you not close family friend of Mr. Terrell? I am with his parents. And was it not as a favor to his parents that you brought him aboard the SO for a posting? It was. And how do you answer that you have deliberately shielded Mr. Terrell from the repercussions of his actions in order to protect your relationship with his family? I think Hamasi actually speaks up on your behalf. Captain says, uh, Council, now you're badgering the witness. Very good. Withdrawn. Thank you, Admiral. One final question, Captain. Why do you believe that your officers disobeyed your commands? I believe that Lieutenant Terrell let his close relationship with Lieutenant Jana influenced his judgment in choosing not to rendezvous with the USS Umbriel. Furthermore, I believe the two remaining members of the away mission, Lieutenant Jana and yourself, allowed the spectacle of an Iconian find to overrule your duty to Starfleet in a pinch. Those are my beliefs as I have stated them. And your logs reflect as much. Very good, Captain. I have no further questions. Very good, Captain. As you are representing yourself, you of course could cross-examine. Do you have anything you wish to say or add at this point? I do not. Very good. Uh, Fleet Admiral looks at Hamasi. Hamasi shakes her head. Ignatrix looks over at Archuleta. 
She'll just remain silent. Very well. We will be taking a 20-minute recess for lunch. And when we come back, I want to see both Lieutenants Jana and Terrell in this courtroom. And she chimes the bell. Court is adjourned. With that, we're going to take our five to ten minute break. We'll be back shortly, everybody. Stick around.
All right, welcome back. If you're just joining us, oh boy, I'm going to tell you right now, go back and watch the VOD because you, you're missing some great stuff. But yeah, long story short, everybody's getting called on the stand and Dantig is ripping everyone a new one. And uh, we sort of resume the little hearing that the Fleet Admiral is holding as the Fleet Admiral takes her seat, Hamasi to her left, Rear Admiral Archuleta to her right. Indutrix sits down, chimes the bell twice, ting, Ting. This is very well. This hearing is resumed. I see that both Lieutenant Jana and Terrell are here. Lieutenant Jana, please take the stand if you would. And uh, you notice that as he enters into the room, Jana is looking quite a bit different. Um, he His fur is relatively unkempt. And although he is wearing his Starfleet uniform, it's not as well ordered as you have known him to wear it before. He's also not wearing the slightly non-regulation earrings that he had uh, always that had always adorned his cat-like ears up until this point. And he sort of slouches his way over to the chair, and as he sits down, he's slumping, but then rises, fixes himself, and looks out at the assembled Admiralty. 
And of course, you're sworn in on whatever higher power you believe in, and Admirals turn it over to Dottig, and Dottig, it's your show again. Lieutenant, please state your name, rank, and duties aboard the station. Jana, Lieutenant. Chief of Operations, Deep Space October. Chief Engineer, USS Umbrail. Excellent. Now, Lieutenant, a uh, question, if you would. Actually, Doctor uh, Commander, forgive me, if I may. I believe that, in accordance with Starfleet regulations, uh, that is, uh, and he actually has to think for a moment. Uh, Chapter 4, Article 12 of the Uniform Code of Justice, I do have the right to make a statement before any questioning begins. Yes, you do. Proceed. Thank you, sir. Uh, admirals, if you'll indulge me. I am very deeply distraught over the events that transpired on our recent mission into brain space. I joined Starfleet because I believed in its mission, that we're here to seek out new life and new civilizations, to learn from them and from their artifice, their technology, the, the products of their ingenuity and their unique perspectives on the world that allowed them to create, well, create worlds. I wanted to see all those strange new worlds that they had made through their technology, how they reshaped and, and redefined the limits of their lives, of their worlds, through the tools that they developed. Here, that was literal. The Iconians had literally physically built a world of their own imagining, created a world to use as a source of power. It's the very embodiment of engineering, of why we build tools in the first place, to in turn help us to build our own worlds. That it has been lost to a power that will use it to reshape other people's worlds, not for their benefit, but to force them to conform to one identical, faceless, characterless way of life, just like the brain themselves in their isolation suits, stripping away everything that makes them unique, everything that makes each of those species that are, have been aggregated into the Breen Confederacy individuals. It's a travesty. It's, it's repugnant abuse of everything that I have joined Starfleet to explore and to experience. I'll never be able to forgive myself for what we've allowed to happen for all of our failures, and we have all failed. The captain has allowed his emotional attachment to his crew to compromise his judgment. The doctor has ignored his responsibilities as a chief medical officer. In accordance with regulation 121 section A, the chief medical officer has the power, and I would say the responsibility, to leave an officer or crewman of his duties, including one of a superior rank, if in his professional opinion, that officer has been deemed medically unfit or otherwise exhibits behaviors that indicate serious impaired judgment, as the captain did. Jaro, uh, that is Lieutenant Terrell, allowed his showboating, his desire to show off and to use the ship that we had constructed to, to violate green space just on a lark, just for the fun of it. Stetco abandoned her responsibilities on the bridge to go hunt down a few random Breen intruders rather than allowing her security force to deal with the problem. She left the ship in a time of crisis when it was under attack. All of our mistakes have led us to the place that we are now. Maybe none of us should be in Starfleet. I don't even know anymore. You can ask me your questions, Doctor. A rousing statement, Mr. Jana. And I applaud you for your bravery and your candor. Indeed, we all do share a part of this failure. As the humans say, there is no I in team. We succeed together, we fail together. <clears throat> that we have failed is not in dispute. But I believe what we are here to determine is the motive of action or inaction of each of us. That alone will be the crucible of character that will determine 
if we've reserved the right to wear this uniform. And right now, I'll focus the light of truth upon you. In my estimation, Lieutenant Jana, and based on your service record, you are an exemplary officer and a remarkable engineer. Was there a question there? There will be. However, being an exemplary officer and an excellent engineer do not necessarily qualify you to make command level decisions or levy opinions against superior officers. <clears throat> How would you answer if I posit that your ardent, almost religious zeal when it comes to technologies that you are unfamiliar with, that zeal borders on fetishism in no small degree. How do you answer this assertion? I've never considered it that way. Uh, technology fascinates me. That's not, that's not a crime. Most engineers are obsessed with it. Yes, of course. But obsession can be a dangerous thing and the well the Nepenthe if you forgive my poeticness of the Iconian world may blind you to external factors give me your estimation of events that occurred on the planet and your reasons for demanding to remain. Well, Doctor, when we first arrived on the planet, we encountered some strange will of the wisp, some artificial intelligence system that had been left behind. I believed that we might be able to interact with that custodian of the facility and learn something about it that could be of use. Not to us, necessarily, but to Starfleet. And at the very least, if we could access that, learn something about the Iconian technology on the planet, the gateways that it might possess, we could secure it from the brain. There might have been any number of technologies there that could have allowed us to move the planet or if necessary, even destroy it. And the opportunity to use those technologies to secure the world against the Breen's interests was why I wanted to stay behind. Hmm. Of course. The Iconian probes that you utilized to help disable the Breen ships one of those probes turned on the Umbriel. Did you program it to do so in an attempt to drive it away? And you can see that at this, Jana looks abjectly horrified. Uh, that what, That's abs absolutely absurd. Doctor, you came up with the idea of suggesting that we should use those probes as a means of securing the Umbriel, of, of defeating the, the Breen attackers that were assaulting it, that were threatening to kill our our crew. I, I, yes or no, Lieutenant? No. Very good. You are offended by that question. Yes, immensely so. It's it's as repugnant as the use of that technology. I, I would be using that ancient relic to kill fellow officers, people that I had considered friends, people I've worked with for years. It, I, I wouldn't do that. I know that. 
the question must be asked. Lieutenant, how many lives was that facility worth? I mean, certainly by our own estimation, it was worth at least two. I think it was worth any number of lives less than those who could be killed by the brain. Untold billions of people could regret this decision that has been made, the loss of this facility. It's the same decision that was made by Captain Picard when he destroyed the Iconian Gateway in the neutral zone. It's the same decision that was made by Commander Sisko. They chose to sacrifice the lives of members of their crew in order to secure those gateways, in order to ensure that they didn't fall into enemy hands. I can't put a number of lives as a price to that because I don't know how many people could have been saved if that gateway hadn't fallen into the Breen's, well, clutches. Well, to be fair, it was never established that this planet held an Iconian gateway at all, was it? Nonetheless, Doctor, the level of engineering that was invested in that facility and the technologies that they now no doubt have access to are orders of magnitude more advanced than ours. Whether there's a gateway on that planet or they can simply use it as for its intended purpose, the creation of vast amounts of energy on an interstellar scale. A great Doesn't threat, matter. to be sure, to be sure. But this facility was inside of brain space. If we were to hold it, then we would be forced to annex that area of space. It would undoubtedly provoke a severe military reaction by the brain and potentially a war. Can one facility be worth that? Sometimes, Doctor, you have to be willing to make sacrifices. And sometimes a smaller war is needed to prevent a larger one. However, you're operating on a series of assumptions that may not be true, and we will never know if they're true because we're never getting back to that facility. There may have been a stellar transporter of some kind, technologies we never even dreamed of. There may have been a system by which we could have transported that planet away. Maybe even we would have been forced to destroy it, and you and I would be dead now. But at the very least, it wouldn't have been in brain hands. I easily could have reconfigured the phased Polaron beams that were yoking it to the black holes to allow the planet to resume its course, drifting back into the planetary, uh, the, the gravitational fields of those black holes. We could have destroyed it if it came down to it. But that option was taken away from us. By whom? By Lieutenant Terrell and in the end by the captain when he rescinded his order to retreat and gave Lieutenant Terrell permission to beam us away. So ultimately you would agree it is the captain's responsibility. Anything that happens under the captain's orders is ultimately his responsibility. And I think Kamasi actually kind of leans forward at that. And you see that even though she's seated, her tail kind of flicks side to side in an agitated motion behind her. And she doesn't growl, but you can tell that she's not amused and simply says, I want you to be very clear on this, Jana. I can sense that there's something you don't want to say. This is a court of truth. And if you're not being completely honest let's just say that's going to reflect very poorly on you. So I'm going to ask the question again, whose fault was it that you're standing here right now and not presumably dead or captured on that planet? In a way it's mine. I should have been able to stop Lieutenant Terrell from beaming us off that planet. I should have been able to come up with some kind of solution, but I didn't. I'm going to take over yeah. for a bit here, Dante. We're going to explore that a little bit. So you had the ability to block a transporter signal, but apparently Terrell circumvented that. Can you be more specific 
your logs are not great about that point. I was using technology with which I was completely unfamiliar. Technology, as I said, that's vastly more advanced than anything that we have. I'm, I wasn't intelligent enough. I didn't understand it well enough. I didn't have enough time to set up a proper transporter inhibitor field that could have blocked Jaro's Lieutenant Terrell's attempt to beam us away from the planet. I see. That's and all. when you were beamed back aboard the Banshee, you didn't resist. You didn't demand to be sent back. You simply sat down and accepted it. I, I let my personal feelings... My personal feelings of betrayal when my friend, the person I thought was my friend, ignored the most desperate plea that I could offer him. He ignored his orders, or at least the captain's initial orders. He ignored the orders of Dr. Dottig, and he ignored my request. I should have, I should have done something when I was being aboard. But I didn't. Masi leans back and says, Dottig, you can take over from here. Lieutenant, we've talked a lot of philosophy. But I think one thing is abundantly clear. And that is you disagree with the outcome of our mission. You believe it should have gone differently. And for my part, I tend to agree. But I'm not afforded the luxury of bias in this position. So I will say this. Your opinion aside, Captain Kijwick was your commanding officer. And regardless of your personal feelings towards any of his orders, you are, as a Starfleet officer, sworn to obey as long as they are lawful. Did Captain Kijwick break the law by ordering you to beam out? I believe that he did. I believe that he violated General Order 5, and that in so doing, he acted against the interests of the Federation and the spirit of that regulation, which cannot be forgotten. Very good. Lieutenant, I'd like to change tack for a moment and ask what was the nature of your relationship with Lieutenant Durrell prior to this incident? Lieutenant Terrell and I met as we entered into Starfleet Academy. We shared a dorm room together throughout all of our four-year tenure. We separated at that point and we exchanged regular messages. We, we kept in touch. And I, that is, over the course of our interactions at the Academy, I grew to believe that he was my friend, my best friend. And how do you define a best friend? Well, Doctor, this is getting a little bit personal about my own history, but um, it's something that you know. But for the record, I was raised on a Cation cargo vessel. I had no children my own age to interact with, not even teens my own age when I got to that point. So when I first arrived at the Academy, I didn't know what that was. And by now, I think 
it's obvious to me that I still don't. So I can't answer that question because I don't have an answer. Very good. But then, would a friend knowingly, willfully ignore imminent danger? Ignore personal consequence to do what they believe was best for their friend. Only in so far as that friend hadn't made his or her wishes clear. One of the things about being a friend, being an officer, is recognizing that other people have a right to make decisions whether that's the decisions of a commanding officer that are lawful and that one has to follow even if one disagrees with them on a personal level, or if that's a, a friend who's making a choice that you don't agree with, but they have the right to make. You can't just impose your will on other people. That's why we have the prime directive. That's at the heart of fe the Federation's ethos, that individuals have the right to self-determination and to make their own choices, even if we know that they're wrong. Thank you, Lieutenant. One, one last question. The Banshee, you designed and oversaw the construction, correct? That's correct. Why? It was a gift for Lieutenant Terrell. When we were at the academy, we came up with design specifications for a small craft. It was award-winning, actually. It was one of the high points of our academy career. And I thought that this gift would be a, a memento in a way, calling back to that shared success that we'd had together. It was a a gift that was both practical and sentimental. If you had it to do again, would you? Build the ship? Yes. Well, I wouldn't build it now, but if I was the same person and I believed the same things that I did then, yes. I don't really understand the question. Nonetheless, you've answered. I have no further questions for Mr. Jada. And Dignatrix looks over at you, Kiswick. Kiswick, do you have any inclination to cross-examine? You are muted, as is tradition. Yes, Admiral. Your witness, then. And Kiswick will stand. And he regards Jana like it's the first time in a long time, almost as if it is the first time he's really seen the lieutenant, uh, akin to when they met. And he sighs and he furrows his brow, collecting his thoughts. Lieutenant, you have mentioned that it is a great honor for an engineer to serve in Starfleet, to be able to explore new civilizations and learn their technologies, learn about their impacts. Would you say that all those things aside on that away mission 
regardless of your enthusiasm for the Iconian technology. Were the mission parameters guiding your actions while you were down there? Respectfully, Captain, I believe that the mission parameters changed when we understood the nature of the artifact that we uncovered. Situations change when you're on the ground. Our original mission was to return the changeling to its time, to restore the time, uh, restore the timeline. But the new mission became securing that facility against the Breen. At what cost? If it was the cost of the ship and its entire crew, I think that would be worthwhile. To ensure that the Breen did not get a hold of that facility. That's correct. I beg the court's indulgence. In a situation where Lieutenant Terrell rendezvoused with Umbriel as ordered, and Breen were able to secure the site and the doctor was incapacitated. Would you make the decision knowingly and willingly to do everything in your power to resist the Breen and sabotage or destroy that facility as you saw fit? Uh, objection. Speculation. That was the indulgence that I begged of the court. I object. Ignatrix looks at Hamasi. Hamasi actually shrugs, doesn't give a answer one way or the other. Ignatrix looks over at her right at Archuleta. Ignatrix gives a very deep sigh and says, Captain, I'm going to need you to roll me a presence command at a difficulty of three. <laughs> First roll of the night. Sorry, what? <laughs> we don't need those. Here's that determination. <laughs> uh, yeah, it might be the only roll we do, right? <laughs> yeah, honestly, it might be. Um, I'm going to go with leadership on this one. Oh, yeah. Okay. And I will use my determination. When in doubt, trust yourself. I know what I'm trying to prove here. Right. Go for it. <sighs> No pressure. Yeah, this would be really. a very bad time to roll complications. <laughs> I'm just going to throw that out there. Uh, oh, please. <laughs> all zeros and all red. Give it to me. No, hey, that's Denied. that's four successes. So you actually get a point of momentum for what it's worth. And Ignatrix. A uh, challenge for determination real quick. Yeah, because it could matter. Now Oops. you don't get it back, unfortunately. So yeah, I think Fleet Admiral just sort of nods and says, I'll allow it. Carry on, Captain. But... Um, Please do get to your point quickly. Understood. Thank you. And he'll sort of side eye Dottig, not menacingly, but respectfully. And you see that Jana leans back in the chair for a moment and strokes his chin while reaching into his pocket and squeezing something. Is this an opportunity to duck for cover <laughs> and then he slumps down in his chair relaxes and just shrugs and says I really don't know the answer to that captain I know that I would have fought and I like to believe that I would have been able to give my life if that was what was needed but I don't know if I could have. Let it be entered into the record that Lieutenant Jana acknowledges his enthusiasm for the technology of new cultures as part of Starfleet's mandate and still resolves to maintain mission parameters ahead of that enthusiasm. And Hamasi speaks up. Is there anything else, Captain? No. 
Very well, Mr. Janna. You may leave the courtroom if you so wish. Thank you, Admiral. And he reaches back into his pocket, leaves something on the chair, and no, goes he back. Doesn't. Oh, to now, take a seat. To be very clear, <laughs> you do go back to your seat. You actually do not leave the courtroom. You stay in the courtroom. Yes. Okay. Which case? Can, the, oh, can defense ahead. counsel observe what was left behind since it was so pointedly said? I think everybody in the front can see it. So for the sake of not only everyone who can see it or isn't in uh, with backroom conversations, what is it that Jana left behind? Jana left behind a small holographic orb. Okay. Um, John, why don't you describe it? Because you know exactly what you're going to see <laughs> so, when you come to the... So it is It is a, a set of old-style classic keys with a keychain on it that has a little uh, holographic orb of, the, of like, the galaxy inside the, uh, the keychain. Um, and he recognizes what it is immediately when he walks up to that chair he recognizes that it is the uh, a kind of memento or keepsake for that starship or the for the small craft that he and Jana had constructed when they were in the academy all right well of course the admirals don't seem to care or don't think it's an issue but uh mm -hmm. ignatrix speaks up and says well mr terrell it's time for your deposition if you would please take the stand he goes up, uh, sees the item, uh, and uh, slips it quietly into his pocket. Um, Terrell is walking rigid, almost uh, almost regimented. Um, his hair is very, very styled um, in the sense of very much Starfleet regulation. <clears throat> his uniform is pressed and uh clean um but much basically looking like he switched roles with uh, jana and of course you are sworn in and as dr Dotte gets up is there anything you would like to say to the court um so he uh he kind of stretches a, a moment and then he uh stands up and uh, basically stretches. Says, Here, I stand before this court. And he's like kind of marching back and forth to answer for my recent actions at the edges of Breen space. We followed a treasure hunt, assisting a valuable ally of Deep Space October, Cord, a Klingon starship captain. The treasure trove, which we were investigating, we uncovered a that it contained a time-displaced founder of the Changelings. It was Captain Kiswick's decision to figure out a way to return the founder back to the correct time stream. We then picked up an anomalous reading on our long-range scanners which was at the edge of Breen space on the Breen side. The decision was made to investigate this scan in a purely scientific capacity. As we arrived, we saw that the rogue planet was being pulled by two black holes through space. By this time, we were well into Breen space, but the decision wa was still made to investigate this unique phenomenon. <sighs> Lieutenant Jana, Dr. Dateg, and I, in the Banshee, were sent to investigate the planet, while the captain and others were distracting the approaching Breen fleet. And I mean fleet, people. <laughs> Using the cloaking system on the Banshee, we were able to avoid detection and the advanced guiding, guiding sy guidance systems, along with the expert navigation assistance of Lieutenant Jana, facilitated our arrival on the extraordinary planet. As requested, 
the uh, as requested by the assignment of the Banshee to DSO, a full field report of the performance of the vessel is available for review. After a short flyover on the planet, we found a subterranean entry point. After a few moments in which can only be described as a blank construct similar to a holodeck, we found ourselves in the control center. In this control center, Dr. Dateg and Lieutenant Jana were able to find the cause of the disruption in one of the couplings from the planet to one of its black hole engines. Within this, we found the USS Bastet, and Dateg was able to establish communication with the Bastet, and Lieutenant Jana was able to return the stability to the drive system of this Iconian planetoid. I was unable to find a way to correct the course of this massive vessel, for lack of a better word. It was at this time that the Umbriel was under attack and outnumbered that I, and I alone, made the decision to go back to the Banshee and engage the Breen to assist the Umbriel. Once the attack was thwarted, it was then that once again, I, and I alone, acted against a direct command from my commanding officer, Captain Kiswick, to rendezvous at a rally point. I believe that the remaining brain fleet would overtake the planet and capture not only the technology present upon that planet, but my fellow crew officers, whom I had left behind. I, and I alone, turned back and penetrated the transport disruption field to beam Dr. Dateg and Lieutenant Jana back aboard the Banshee and hastily retreated before the remainder of the Breen fleet could arrive. It is this officer's opinion that had I not retrieved Dateg and Jana from the planetoid, which was now fully and unquestionably in Breen space, that we would have unnecessarily lost two valued officers of Starfleet to the Breen, along with the Iconian planetoid. I accept this consequences, whatever they may be, of Starfleet command when it comes to my penalties related in this, to this encounter. But I reiterate the decisions made with regard to first leaving my crewmates on the planet while going to engage the Breen and the actions of recovering those crewmates indirect viola were in direct violation of my captain's orders and they were mine and mine alone. And candidly, I will also tell this court that I do not regret any of those choices as I believe those actions, that because of those actions, that Starfleet will possibly continue to benefit from the distinguished service of two of the finest officers I have ever had the pleasure of serving with. I also humbly submit that I was put on DSO by my mother in an attempt to make me a better officer under the command of Captain Kiswick. And the training and guidance I received from this man was among the best life and career lessons anyone could ever hope for. I also must say that the assignment of Lieutenant Jana to this station was also no mere coincidence. I believe it was also done to keep me in line and give me something to care for. This move not only succeeded in its desired goal, but it also hindered the career of a true explorer. I care about this crew this station and the people on it. And if Starfleet finds the need to punish me for my actions during this encounter, I will accept those consequences. But in closing, the majority of the questionable decisions made during this event lie mainly on my shoulders and I accept them. I've already lost a mentor, a best friend and several other friends. Nothing else you can do to me will have any fucking impact. 
and he sits on the chair. And I think it's very important to say that there is dead silence after that. Like, you could literally hear a micrometeor hit the hole outside. It's that quiet. And then Fleet Admiral Ignatrix kind of coughs and goes, <clears throat> Mr. Datig, uh, I believe this is your witness. Uh, Datig will nod and rise yet more slowly. And it's obvious to everybody in the courtroom that he is exhausted. And we'll turn to Mr. Terrell. That was an excellent speech, Mr. Terrell. But one that I feel may be misguided. That's okay, Doctor. I've been called worse things by better people. Very good. <laughs> Mr. Terrell, is it safe to say that in your tenure as a Starfleet officer you have amassed a bit of a reputation as being one who skirts the guidelines of what is acceptable? I am an officer that is driven by human decency. Human decency. <clears throat> human decency is an interesting way to put it. I've noted, or rather it has been noted on your records by Captain Kijwick that you have been reprimanded a total of three times, including this most recent incident. But there are a number of incidents that have been largely disregarded. There's one in particular that I would like to ask you about. Your recent violation of Regulation 76 prohibiting pointing of a phaser at a fellow Starfleet officer without a valid reason. Did you not, on start date, and I'll give the appropriate start date, draw a phaser and fire upon the Chief Medical Officer of Deep Space October in Shuttle Bay 4? <laughs> Stunning and necessitating mild neuroregenesis. <laughs> Boothy reaches out. Stecco, Stecco, calm yourself. Yes, but would you uh, like to regale the court with the reason why you might have been shot? Yes, as I recall, in a jest, I drew a phaser but never pointed it at you, instead leaving it at my side. You instead took that opportunity to, well... In your position, I can't say I would have done differently. But that being said, and you can see he's kind of chuckling to himself he, when he recounts this memory, but... He who hesitates together. is lost, Doctor. Indeed. And if you ever draw the weapon, you should be ready to shoot it. Mm. Wise words. Was it not also true that on said star date you were ordered to stay away from that shuttle bay, not enter it under any circumstances and disregard that said order. I was asked to avoid said shuttle bay. I never received a direct command from the captain to avoid, uh, to not go to that shuttle bay. Mm. The subterfuge that was uh, being used brought a lot of things into question. And with recent events of changeling infiltrators on the base and other things, I would have definitely had to investigate for the good of the station. Right, because you would have You never know of... when there would be a cargo bay full of, let's say, biomimetic gel. 
very true. Very true. And as you said, you are an officer driven by human decency. Your fond feelings for the station and those that dwell within it demanded action and you took that action. Yet, an individual is injured and you somehow escape consequence. You've made a career out of escaping consequence for your actions, wouldn't you say? I received an official reprimand in my file. I don't see what other consequences you w would have wished me to have. I don't know, maybe. maybe turnabout is fair play, but we'll just leave it at that. <laughs> Mr. Terrell, let's talk about the most recent mission to the Iconian planet within brain space. You are attempting to shoulder the weight of responsibility for extracting Lieutenant Jana and myself from the planet. You are attempting to absolve Captain Kijwick of any wrongdoing. And that is admirable. Admirable. Well, but misguided, I feel. Because as a commanding officer, and as a man of quality, Captain Kijwick is compelled to take responsibility for all the officers under his command. He would be compelled to proverbially take that bullet for you. So your efforts here, if put to serious thought, are entirely in vain, and I posit for show. Doctor, have you ever tried to wrangle in a male Terran? Uh, I mean, I've been trying to get you to do a physical for two years, if mm. that counts. And you've been effective at doing that? Not all at once, no. Okay. Your point, Mr. Terrell. Well, no, 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 no point. Does that mean you're a failure of a chief medical officer? And I think Hamasi kind of coughs, laughs, and goes, huh, hmm. <laughs> Remind Mr. Terrell who's on the stand here. <laughs> My apologies. Well, Mr. Terrell, let's point that lens back at you. Would you would you consider yourself to be a failure as an officer? Yes. And why is that? I make, I make decisions that in the long run to save, save lives. But I, uh, I tend to do so because I think it's the right thing. Some would call that a strength. And in certain situations, it certainly is. But I would ask, as a member of the chain of command, do you not yield the ability to, to do what you believe is right at all times 
to the authority of your captain or commanding officer? Or rather, should you? In reference to going back and retrieving yourself and Lieutenant Jana, I would have to say that I did not have time to explain to the captain the types of technology that I saw upon the planet. I also do not know if the captain knew or not that you and Lieutenant Jana were not present on the Banshee. Do you believe that your actions were justified? Yes. Then why have you discreetly filed a transfer request off Deep Space October? Are you running away again? I no longer wish Is to... Rick will object here? Yes, Captain. The witness's career aspirations are not on trial here. I think Ignatrix looks over at Archuleta for this one first. What do you want me to say, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Why are you looking Fourth at me? Fourth wall break. <laughs> she looks back at her like, and? What about it? <laughs> and Ignatrix nods, looks over to Hamasi, and Hamasi just kind of shrugs. And the tricks looks back at the captain and says, sustained, um, either make your point, Dante, or move on. My point is this. Would someone at peace not choose to remain where they are sure in their own actions? My departure from this space station would make it easier for several people involved. I see. Would you count yourself among that number? No. Very good. No further questions. Mr. Kiswick is your witness. Kiswick will stand, nod to departing council, and approach uh, the witness. I'm going to move my little token so that I'm standing sort of <laughs> between the witness and the admirals. Mm. <sighs> Sure, in their own actions, departing council wants that to be clear. Every officer should be pretty sure in their actions performed in the line of duty. Mr. Terrell, you said that you are driven by decency and regardless of the conflicts your drive has had in your performance of duties on Deep Space October. Can I ask you, what informs your sense of decency? I don't understand. Well, surely our sense of decency has to come from somewhere. Is it not learned from actions and inactions taken in our past to inform our behavior and, and guide us in the present and the future. Yes. In your service aboard Deep Space October, 
you have performed unswerving duties as the helm officer, but you have also been essential in several feats of engineering that have saved the station and the Umbriel. As an engineer, you work with calculation. Is it appropriate to say that an engineer relies on known quantities to inform their decision making when troubleshooting a problem as serious as those events in which you have helped save lives? Yes. Um, objection. Council is leading the witness. Well, the witness has already answered, so sorry, Dottic. You got to be quicker on the draw. had a point to make here i'm trying to rephrase it <laughs> uh, um all right you acknowledge that as an engineer you need to be informed by previous feats of engineering to understand what you can do now objection yes this is not formally Dante. assigned to engineering ignatrix just sort of narrows her eyes a little bit and says that's not something that that, that isn't an objectionable thing withdrawn no captain you okay and <laughs> Ada just sort of sits back in her chair like okay I'm not running this show anymore go ahead <laughs> we'll go back to decency lieutenant can you restate the mission parameters as you understood them before you departed Umbriel on the Banshee. To investigate the rogue planetoid for signs of how to return the founder back to its own time. Back to its own time. A known quantity, the past. Lives that have lived and died. Lives that have sacrificed because of this one individual. Unknown quantity. Lieutenant, based on what you knew about those mission parameters and their significance, would you say that your actions informed by your sense of decency chose the known quantity established as the past over an unknown quantity the capture of the base by the brain yes no further questions as Kiswick retakes his seat uh, Ignatrix just sort of leans back up and says right well, the admirals and I need a few moments to converse before we deliver our final speeches. I want everyone to Admiral. remain in the courtroom. Oh, yes, Mr. Dantig. If I may, I have one final individual to summon for deposition. Is that member a uh, person of the senior staff of Deep Space October? Not directly then you're just going to have to suck it up because I have things to do. Admirals and I will be out for five to ten minutes. Till then, this court is adjourned. Ting. And the admirals step out. But, as almost as if this was an anticipated move that the players have been trying to get me to do the entire night, uh, it is at this point that uh, Counselor Watney is allowed into the room. Well, it's a lot emptier in here than I thought. Kiswick will stand. Jen. Yeah, I'm here for you. I didn't expect to see you. I'm your wife. I live on the station. <laughs> I didn't expect <laughs> to see you at these proceedings. Again, I'm your wife, and I live on this station. <laughs> Fair point. <laughs> How you doing? 
I think I have represented the case well. Well, it's great. This is that, I mean, I mean, I was here to, you know, support you, but it seems I arrived late. Uh, that one's my fault, I guess. <laughs> What's going on here? Witness for the prosecution. Character witness. Hmm. Unexpected. I'll explain later. Yeah, I think we could all use a drink after this, right? I need to sleep for about three years. I believe I should seclude myself until the Admiral's deliberations are over. Okay, well, I'll be here if you need me. And just for reference, um, what's Janna doing and what is Terrell doing? Uh, Terrell has just taken up and he's basically just walking around in this area of the court. Okay. And Janna has just departed for parts unknown, although he will be heading towards his quarters. So just so there's a reminder, you were told to all remain in the courtroom until the Admiral's returned. Ah, you can still mistake, choose then. to leave. I just want you to be aware of the fact you would be denying an Admiral's orders. Yes. Okay. He's going to try to leave at least. If somebody stops him, then... No, I think Boothby then. maybe looks at you leaving and uh, looks at Stetko. And I think it's safe to say Stetko might not notice because of all the emotions in the room. And yeah, Jana, you may certainly leave the room. Oh yeah, Stetko would be feeling immense amounts of sorrow coming off of Jaro. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that's why and, she uh, holds, like funerals for that very reason. And um, his right hand is just clenched in a fist and there's droplets of blood coming out from between his fingers. Mm. Well, the good news is you don't have to fret for long because Master Chief Arnold uh, kind of looks and says, all right, the admirals are coming back in. Sit down. Of course, as everybody sits back down, admirals come in one by one. And Kishwick the fleet admiral... Is checking oh, oh. On Pro Kishwick is just looking at prosecution to see if they're going to call their witness back to the room. Um, my witness. Which one? Jonna left. Um, Dante did not notice. Okay. He's been sort of sitting just like face forward. Just, just like. Um, Stekka yeah. will like go up to him and just put a hand on his, sh his shoulder. And as the Admiral sit down, Fleet Admiral Ignatrix sort of sighs and says, well, I think it's important that we let the most junior of Admirals rule first. Uh, Rear Admiral Archuleta, uh, your thoughts on this matter? Yes. Um, where is Lieutenant Jana? And at that, Ignatrix and Hamasi actually kind of look around the room, and Hamasi humps in what is visibly anger, but Ignatrix keeps her cool and simply says, Yes, where is Mr. Jana? And I'm going to spend two threats. I think it's safe to say, Jana, based on what I saw in chat earlier, chair where you were sitting contains your comm badge. Correct. And I think Ignatrix just sort of sees that, nods, and says, I'll deal with Jana personally. But you were saying, yes, Archuleta. I was. Um, we might have our differences, Ibsen. But I cannot deny the effect you've had on your senior officers. They're all quite forthcoming with their opinions, steady in their assertions, and competent in their abilities and positions. 
But mostly what I've come to realize is that they, with perhaps the exception of Lieutenant Jana, all believe in you. That is the mark of a commanding officer that is good at their job. And what I would say to our exception were he here, Mr. Jana, is this, he must believe in himself, of course, but more so we all must believe in the ability of those around us to uplift us in a time of desperation. There are no other options out here in the dark. We cannot do it alone. So Captain Kishwick, although I disagree with your motives entirely, I find no wrongdoing in your actions. That is all. Ignatrix nods, looks over to Mossy. Mossy clears her throat, stands up and says, what I've heard today is very disturbing. Were this not the advent of a new chapter in Starfleet exploration and perhaps a new era of Starfleet, I might be calling for resignations from several of the officers that have testified today. However, the final decision lies with the Fleet Admiral. But I wanted to make it very clear that while this is, for some of the officers involved, their first offense, that does not excuse the gravity of the results that have come about as a result of their actions. At the very least, and she looks at Indatrix for confirmation, I will be making sure that a formal reprimand for all actions that occurred on this mission occurs in every single officer's record. And then she sighs and says, look, uh, I might seem like a hard ass, but I got to be clear here. I was once in a similar situation. I was trapped in the Gamma Quadrant with a fleet that was ready to tear itself apart. And I don't envy you. I, I don't envy the task that you had to go through. I don't envy the task you have in front of you. But what I will say is this. It will get better. It's not going to be easy, but it will get better. And Amasi sits down, and Ignatrix sort of does that sort of professional curt nod at them. And then, almost breaking character, um, Ignatrix just sort of sighs deeply, leans back in her chair, looks up at the ceiling, and then finally stands. I don't think there's an easy way to say this, so I will simply be blunt. What we had on the station before that mission was a family. What we have now cannot be called such. And regardless of what this court decides to do, I think what Lieutenant Terrell's words said are true. There is nothing this court can do that can make up for the fact that a family has become broken as a result of this mission. This isn't easy. This, this is not a decision I wanted to make. I wanted this to be, as Hamasi has said, I wanted this to be a happy occasion. But in certain aspects, though I am lax with some rules, I believe my hands are tied in this matter. And she looks specifically at Lieutenant Commander Stetko. Miss Stetko, if you would please stand. She stands immediately at attention. Stetko, for your interesting application of the rules, in addition to, shall we say, choice times to use patient confidentiality, you will only receive a formal reprimand for your actions. You will also be barred from promotion for a period of six months at which time your promotion may or may not be reconsidered. And she kind of lets that sit for a moment and says, Yes, did you know? One of the officers among you, or shall I rephrase that, some of the junior officers beneath you, made it very, very clear in their reports that you probably deserve a promotion, one which I'm sure Kiswick may have granted at some point. Thank you. You may sit. Mr. Dottig. Dottig will stand. 
for your inability to not realize that the captain's judgment was impaired, for not asserting yourself as away team commander. We hereby strip you, strip, you, strip you of the rank of commander, demoting you to the rank of lieutenant commander, and hereby bar you from retaking the command exam for three years. You may sit. <gasps> Captain Kiswick. You are muted, as is tradition. We will continue to speak even if you are not muted. For your violation of General Order 5, for numerous infractions of the Uniform Code of Justice, of General Orders, I need not go on. You are hereby stripped of the rank of Captain, demoted to Commander. You will remain in Station Command of DSO until such a time that a replacement can be found, at which point you will be returning to either Zald or the Klingon homeworld. I really don't care which. Understood. Finally, oh. Lieutenant Terrell. He stands up. And again, almost breaking character, Ignatrix sort of smiles. I see a lot of pain in you. I see a lot of potential in you. Were it not for the fact that my daughter had gone through a similar circumstance, I might have thrown the book at you like I have done so many of your colleagues. I'm going to be lenient, and let me be clear here. You only get this second chance once. You fuck up again, that's it. You go to a penal colony, and I don't, I don't lose any sleep over it. However, for your rash actions, on that away mission, for disobeying direct orders, you are hereby demoted to the position of ensign until such a time you can demonstrate that you are able to take orders and follow them as is mandated in Starfleet code. Also, on a lighter note, your transfer request is accepted. You will be joining the USS Congo when it arrives. Boothby, and Boothby steps up. Uh, yes, Admiral, do you have anything else to add from the Undine side of things? Boothby kind of sighs and says, No, nah, but if I must be honest, Lieutenant, or Fleet Admiral, I think you probably could have been a little bit nicer to them. As you say, Boothby, as you say. Very well, this court is, demo uh, this court is hereby adjourned. Tings the bell twice. And everybody steps, or at least the admirals, step out of the room. And because I want most of the decompression to happen off screen, we're actually going to now cut to the promenade. Where I believe it might be fair for me to say at this point, a badgeless <sighs> Lieutenant Jana might be looking out at the stars. Would that be a fair assumption? Certainly. You don't know at what point that she's there. It's kind of just like one moment you're by yourself, just sort of staring out at the stars. The next moment, the fleet admiral is sitting next to you or standing next to you, whichever it might be. She doesn't say anything at first. She sort of waits to see if you'll breach the silence. And if you don't, she'll say something. But I, I do want to give you the chance to, to say something if you so wish. As soon as she almost appears next to him, Jana seems for a moment as if he is going to snap to attention and then sort of awkwardly fiddles with his collar where his pips should be but are no longer there and then returns to staring out the window. And he is not going to be the one to initiate conversation. Lieutenant Jana, or I guess just Jana now, do you know where you're going to go from here? I guess the only real option for me is going back home to my parents' cargo freighter. Uh, chief engineer of a starbase of thousands of people to uh, scrubbing plasma conduits on a broken down freighter. 
you sure there's not a posting on trade vessel you'd like? Um, I I am a fleet admiral. I have connections. Hell, if you wanted, you could probably go back and teach the academy for your stunt with the Vadis. No, I uh, I think I just want to go home. And she kind of takes your hand and she presses your badge into the palm of your hand. It says, I'm putting you on leave without pay. Not that we actually get pay in Starfleet. It's an old traditional saying. I want you to take that badge. I want you to hold on to it for a period of six months. After the time you've had to rest, think things over, then you can submit your resignation to me. But until that time, you're just on leave. And, um, Admiral, if I may ask, what, uh, what were the results of the trial? At least insofar as I'm concerned. I'm sure Scuttlebutt will inform me about all the others. Well, since you ran out of the room before I could tell you, I was simply just going to order you to go to Ryza for a month and chill out, because Lord knows you need it. Ryza's so hot and muggy, though. Okay, would you like to go to the Klingon homeworld instead? Ryza's fine. I'll... It was a I'll joke. I don't that. care what pleasure planet you go to, just for the love of all that is holy, you need to relax, Jada. Well, for whatever it's worth, thank you, Admiral. Hmm. Also, I got the vibe you don't really care much for Lieutenant Terrell, but I was nice. I gave him a second chance, much like I'm giving you. I see potential in the both of you. I just hope that it won't go to waste. I suppose so do I, but who knows what the future will bring. Well, I could tell you, but half the fun is seeing where the chips fall. And at that, Ignatrix kind of pats you on the back and steps away. And our final shot is of Jana staring out at the stars as the camera pulls out of deep space October, orbits around the station, and then fades to black. And that is the end of Deep Space October. Wow. Aaron, great job. Um, just what? <laughs> phenomenal. <laughs> phenomenal. Yeah. I mean, Come on. I. Um, Time to do a procedural. I'm super excited for the next game. I feel like I can breathe after all that, but um, it's been an absolute pleasure on October. Mm -hmm. You guys. Do we want to do a footer on, on what the next game is going to be? I know yeah, we're, we're going to take but... a few moments before I kill the stream. So uh, <laughs> that transfer request uh, that I mentioned uh, being granted for Terrell. Uh, yes, the USS Congo is going to be the new ship. Um, it is going to be a Trident class ship. Um, Terrell is going to be on it as, I believe, chief engineer. Uh, Dottig will be reprising his role, not as a doctor, though, but as science officer. And then, uh, Watney, you're coming as chief medical as Alel from Fenrir. Yeah, that's right, baby. <laughs> coming and back. Then my, I, I think if I were to play favorites, I think uh, certain uh, Lee Tobin would be my favorite returning character because, oh, man, <laughs> does that character have depth. Yeah. Um he will be returning as captain, which is very nice. I'm very looking forward to that. And then uh, I think Kishwick's actually our only new character, Fives. XB's baby. <laughs> but yeah, uh, so we will be taking next week off. But on February 9th, we will be uh, resuming. Well, not resuming, but starting uh, STA Congo. And it will be in the same time slot as this. Uh, same people, same people involved. Should be a good time. But yeah, uh, since this is the end of a series, final thoughts from people. Anything you want to say to the lovely people at home that may have been watching this entire time? You don't get a lot of opportunities to play an arc in Star Trek that doesn't have the happy ending where all the, you know, the ribbons are tied and, and all that. Um, yeah, so this was a hell of an experience. 
I, I owe it to my colleagues and to ELH. Yeah, I specifically want to say thank you, ELH, for your storytelling, your commitment every week to us and all the work you put in because this can't happen without you. So, mm -hmm. well, you. I think, I think, uh, a certain Matthew said it in chat earlier. I feel like the, the, the patients are running the asylum. I, I think I just sit here, throw a thread at you guys and things happen. <laughs> 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 yeah, this was very RP heavy. So, um, yeah, very lucky to have you guys as my peers in this, um, hobby. So thank you. I will just say GG, everybody. GG, GG, yeah. everybody, GG. 100%. And I will just say thank you all for being such amazing role players and amazing people for making this experience everything that it has been. And here's to another year's worth of uh, adventures. I'll drink to here, that. Here, here. Back in the yeah. saddle. All right. Well, uh, ladies and gentlemen. There's one last person to thank. Oh, are we thanking? We're thanking the audience, man. Oh, yeah. We got to thank the audience. Yeah, <laughs> thank you for watching, stories. everybody. <laughs> yes. There you go. The stories nice would tag. go vastly love unknown. You, love you, Chad. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, we don't have anybody to raid tonight, so I'm actually just going to kick us over to the credit scene. Stay safe. Stay healthy. And until February 9th, see you stream.